Hello and welcome to Unheard. I'm Florence Reed. So it's official. Marianne Williamson is the first candidate to announce that she is standing for Democrat leader in the US primaries, with the eventual hopes of becoming President of the United States. Before even, the sitting president, Joe Biden, has announced. This is not Williamson's first rodeo. She ran in 2020, but she was eclipsed on the progressive side of the ballot by Senator Bernie Sanders, who she eventually endorsed. Unlike other candidates, Sanders included, she does not have a grand governmental title or, in fact, any political experience at all. But a bit like another candidate you might remember, Donald J. Trump, she has created quite the cult of personality for herself. With a long career as a spiritual advisor to the stars, Oprah included, a self-help author selling millions of books, and a motivational speaker, could Williamson heal the American soul? Happily, she joins me live from the East Coast to find out. I'm going to start by doing something slightly annoying, which is to ask you to listen to me reading out something that you said in the past. You said on Oprah that you would write a prayer for America. This is in the 1990s on one of your early appearances. And this is that prayer. If I'm a conservative, God, heal me of my thoughts that liberals are the problem. If I'm a liberal, God, heal me of my thoughts that conservatives are the problem. So that does beg the question, what is the problem? And is it the same now as it was in that time in the 1990s? President Dwight Eisenhower said that the American mind at its best is both liberal and conservative. So there are forces in this country who have created this drama, which is really a fiction, that left and right are these polar opposites that have to see each other as the enemy. When American society is working at its best, there's a kind of complementary aspect, a kind of yin and yang, as it were. Um, Nobody has a monopoly on truth. There are high-minded conservative values and high-minded liberal values. The problem is not the left-right dynamic. That's just a canard. The real issue is between the powerful and the powerless. So the left-right dynamic is artificially created. Not that the, the dynamic is artificially created, but this stringent oppositional uh, drama between the two is artificially created. All of that is meant to be a veil that hides from the, the eyes of people what is really going on in this country. And that is an economic dichotomy. It's an economic dichotomy which has to do with the fact that over the last 48 years in this country, there has been a massive transfer of wealth. That's putting it nicely. There has been a theft. There has been a transfer of $50 trillion from the bottom 90% to the, to the 1% of people in this country. And what that has done is uh, turned us into this small group of economic royalists, as FDR called them, whose wealth creation is far too often at the expense of just the average American having any hope of getting into the game. This 1% has easy access to medical uh, care. It has easy access to education, easy access to childcare, easy access to uh, staying home after the birth of a child, and easy access to, at the very least, a paid living, uh, a, a livable wage, and much, much more. Policy after policy goes towards enabling a very small group of Americans not only to get rich, but to even get richer all the time. This kind of dire state that the American dream seems to be in that you've just kind of laid out for us there, do you think that's got better or worse since Biden took to the presidency? Do you think that post-Trump things have improved as Biden promised they yes. would? Yes, he kept us from falling over the cliff. The problem is we're still six inches away from it. So what President Biden represents is the effort to help people survive an unjust system. What a Democratic president should be offering is an agenda to end the unjust system. That's the difference between Biden and a genuine progressive message. So he's tinkering with the system to make well, it more palatable for the people at the bottom? In essence, yes. It's tweaking things. It's taking an incremental approach, uh, which amounts to far too little, and at this point, far too late. Uh, we have to get moving, and we have to do more than just turn the ship in a slightly different direction. We need to make a U-turn in this country, because our democracy and our, our people, we're on a collision course with ourselves. This might sound like a slightly strange question, but you are effectively now running for president, or at least starting the process that would lead to a presidential run. What does it mean to be an American president these days? What is the role of the president? Does it actually reflect the original principles of a presidential office? Well, that has to do with the person who is occupying the office. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said the primary job of the presidency 
is not administrative, but moral leadership. And the president, we don't have a king, uh, not if, you know, we don't have a monarch, we don't have an all-powerful monarch, nor should we. Uh, we don't have someone with a magic wand who can come in there, not that you do, by the way, we realize you have a constitutional monarchy, but we don't have the kind of old-fashioned situation or dictatorship where one person has a, uh, a, a magic wand that can just make things happen. Uh, the president, there's, we have separation of powers and equal powers, a Supreme Court, legislative branch, Senate, House, and, um, and the presidency. But the president does have a lot of power. The president sets the agenda. The president sets a vision. The president has the bully pulpit. The president <clears throat> has the power of the veto. The president gets to appoint the people who run the various agencies. And the, and the president can, uh, uh, can give executive orders. So there's a lot of power in the U.S. presidency. In many ways, a kind of psychic center of American consciousness. And do you think that they have a responsibility to be a kind of philosopher king? You spoke about a, a kingly role earlier. Is there a responsibility as a president to be a thought leader in that way? Because I think Trump probably does hold, you know, a reputation as being someone who successfully, for the better or for worse, you might argue, thought led a lot of America. Biden, I'm not so sure. I think you make a good point. We have not had the sort of philosopher king in, in many decades. I think the last one like that really would be, would be uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I think that Jimmy Carter had a philosophical aspect to him, but he, he, he was not able to effectively use that uh, as part of his presence, presidency in a way to sway the nation, obviously. Um, you're right. Uh, Donald Trump did set a vision for this country, but it's a very dark vision. So when you say, is that part of the role of the presidency? It is not inherently part of the role of the presidency. The role of the presidency, beyond the things that I mentioned, is whatever the president makes of it. I believe, and, and in my running, uh, I definitely would wish to inhabit the space from a place where my philosophical, psychological, spiritual understanding is absolutely core to my political perspective. Among other things, it means knowing that you can't just treat cause, excuse me, you can't just treat symptoms, you have to treat cause. If you don't take care of your children today, you will have a mental health crisis later. If you don't take care of people's needs today, you, you will have more prisons later. If you don't take care of your democracy and truly deliver to people the blessings of democracy today, you will have a threat of authoritarianism later. So yes, I believe that the philosopher king image is simply what the 21st century demands. We're talking here about the body politic, this kind of idea that the political health of the nation can be administered to like a body in a doctor's office. Is that something that you think about a lot? You talk about antidepressants, big pharma during COVID, the, the mandates on vaccinations. Do you think about yourself as a kind of doctor for the soul of America? Why are so many people upset? You know, it's like with our, with our healthcare system in general. We need to look not just at how to pay for, um, for healthcare, and I certainly am for universal healthcare, but we also have to ask ourselves, why are so many uh, more Americans living with chronic illness as opposed to, for instance, the people in, in European countries? And the same thing with our sadness, with our despair. We have to do more than treat it. We have to ask why are so many people having such a hard time simply making it through the day in this country? I'd like to talk to you a bit about the idea of, of mistrust and the increasing levels of some call it skepticism, others call it conspiratorial thinking that has arisen or erupted in America over the last decade. Why do you think that is? Telling the truth is important. Telling the truth itself has an ameliorative effect. There have been so many times when the United States government either hasn't told the truth or has told the truth, but not the whole truth and not nothing but the truth, that people have lost faith in what the government has to say. Same with the media. What has happened in the United States is that there's this conglomeratization of corporate media, which so often does more to serve the corporate agenda of its owners than to serve the real purpose of journalism, which is to elucidate what's going on in the world for the sake of the public. And in the absence of these institutional guarantees that we're really being given the real scoop, people start to look elsewhere. They start to look at whatever website happens to be uh, 
on their on their screen at any given time. And as we know, the way algorithms work, if they already have a kind of paranoid tendency, then whatever would feed that paranoid tendency on any particular topic is what will appear um, on their feed. So once again, go back to the symptom. When government abdicates its proper role, when journalism abdicates its proper role, all for the sake of its obeisance to its own corporate owners or corporate donors, then it, it, you know what it's like? It's like an alcoholic family system where kids know mo neither mommy nor daddy are telling us the truth here. Mommy and daddy are both like, you know, there, there's, just, there's a lot of gaslighting going on here. So the kids are feeling the agitation, and that's what's happening in this country. So we have to shore up the ethical core of institutions that have abdicated their own ethical core. Once again, you have, to, you have to feed the immune system. You can't just treat the disease. Self-help seems to have come back into the conversation in a, a massive way, possibly thanks to platforms like this on YouTube, because we have figures now like Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, Matt Walsh, who are masculinity influencers, where it might have been shameful to seek out self-help books in the aisles of a library or a bookshop for men in the 90s and noughties. It now seems to be totally out in the open that you should try and better yourself through following the advice of these hypermasculine figures. I just wonder what you think of them. Look, it's a free society, and, and every, nobody has a monopoly on truth, and everybody gets to say what they want to say. The vast majority of, peop of times, I certainly do not agree with the, uh, the people that you just uh, mentioned, but then I'm sure they don't agree with me either. Uh, as long as somebody stays within the line of advocating violence, advocating hate, then I could think that they're awful, but that's none of my business. They, they get to say what they want to say. The bigger problem is the lack of critical thinking among the population. So it, it, you know, the, the, in a healthy society, voices that truly speak outside the bounds of, of appropriate moderation are kind of flushed out. If you have a government that's telling you the truth, if, uh, if you have uh, journalism, mainstream journalism that's telling you the truth, if you have an educational uh, system that genuinely trains people to know how to think, not what to think, but how to think, then they know when to say, oh, that's crazy. Oh, no, I'm not interested in that. And that's the problem is not just that those, that some people say things that are really outside the bounds of what you and I might consider dignity or decency or advocacy for real freedom or democracy. The real problem is how many people hear that and go, oh, that sounds reasonable, when such ideas should not, in my mind, be considered reasonable at all. Though many of your detractors would say that many of the ideas that you come to the table with, be they spiritual or whatever else, are unreasonable themselves. So. You, you are well, yourself a victim of this exact problem. Well, I don't know. I suggest that we love each other. I suggest that we forgive each other. I suggest that we put humanitarian principles before economic principles. Um, these are quite. These are actually more radical ideas than you might think when, when put into practice. Much. I think that's the point. <laughs> I think that's the point. And also the original idea at the core of our de uh, Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal with God-given inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That was radical. It was radical in 1776, and it's radical today. So if people say her ideas are radical, and they're simply ideas that align with our own first principles, then uh, I certainly don't apologize for that. So let me dig into a few bits of policy that you brought up in 2020, just to see if they still apply in 2024 sure. and onwards. Um, the Department of Children and Youth, we've been speaking there about the kind of despair and ennui felt by a lot of young people in America. What do you think the youth of America need? What, what's your prescription for them? In a, in a neoliberal economic system where the, the, the right of stockholders to make more money is placed above the rights of other stakeholders, whether it has to do with workers or community or, or in, environment, animals, I think the greatest collateral damage is America's children. Ameri uh, children are not old enough to vote, so they don't have a constituency. They're not old enough to work, so they don't represent any financial leverage. So people who are what you might call free market fundamentalists, 
don't see any real function, you know, they'll, for a child. They'll say things like, this country should be run like a business. No, it shouldn't be. It should be run, if, if anything, should, perhaps like a conscious business, but it should be run like a family. You put your children first. We know now things about the first 10 years of life that we didn't even know 10 years ago. Early childhood, earlier than that, the first five years of life. So the government, we should have a massive, if anything, we should have a massive transfer of resources in the direction of our young. If you really want a great economy 20 years from now, take care of your children 10 and younger today. So what well, that has to do with free childcare, that has to do with the best uh, world-class uh, education for every single child in America. It has to do with paid family leave so that children have the scientifically proven uh, benefit of being in the arms of, the, of an adult who loves them in those first weeks and months of life. So I think a lot of Americans would be really shocked to see some of the numbers, some of the statistics. And that's, and that's it compared, by the way, to European countries, other advanced democracies. Um, American children are, it's almost a, a level of collective child abuse in my mind, how few resources we give comparatively. Overhauling the entire American education system is not going to be cheap, but I suppose somewhere you might find some additional funding is in the budget that's currently being used in Ukraine. You've spoken about this before and the war efforts over there, $50 billion in aid that's been sent over the last year to the Ukrainian government. Do you think that if you were in the position of president, you would end that funding? You spoke in 2020 about the Department for Peace, a kind of department you would create, which would focus on non-military intervention. Do you think that we have over-militarized our support of Ukraine? Well, you know, with Ukraine, the disease is already full blown. So let's put that one aside for just a moment. The Department of Peace, if you go back to the integrative model of health, the Department of Peace represents that proactive effort to boost the immune system of, of, of the societal, you know, of, of the body politic. There are four statistics, which, four factors, which when present are statistically proven to bring forth a higher incidence of peace and a lower incidence of violence. Number one, greater economic opportunity for women. Number two, greater educational opportunity for children. Three, the reduction of violence against women. And four, the, the um, amelioration of unnecessary human despair. So look at what we do in the United States. We have <clears throat> $858 billion in our military budget, which is just absurd. Then we have 60 something point something billion dollars for our State Department and 1.9 billion dollars for USAID. Now USAID, which has to do with aid to countries, aid and development, this has more to do with the creation of peace than um, does anything like the military or anything even like the State Department. The State Department, however, used to have far more. If you look at the 60 billion given to the State Department versus the 858 billion given to the military, the State Department used to have far more, uh, far more influence compared to the military, particularly the military industrial complex than it now does, and this should change. I do see Ukraine as a very different situation, however. I understand that uh, America has had our own imperialistic uh, misadventures. I think the Iraq war was, a, was criminal. I think that the last 20 years in Afghanistan uh, were similarly uh, militarily, military malfeasance. Um, I'm not naive about the imperialistic uh, misadventures of the United States. I don't think any of us should be naive and we shouldn't ignore those things. Do you At include the, the expansion of NATO in that list of Yes, absolutely. Our, yes, absolutely. Our behavior with NATO, our behavior with the Aegis missiles in Poland and Romania. Those things are true. However, I do not believe that the imperialism, imperialistic adventures of the United States now give a free pass to Vladimir Putin to, perpetra uh, to perpetrate a, uh, an imperialistic war of his own. So I do stand for uh, the Western alliance taking a stand against Vladimir Putin in his invasion of the sovereign nation of Ukraine. I suppose the, that slightly ambiguous idea of taking a stand, the question there has to be, well, what stand and what 
to what extent do you push? Absolutely. Are you pushing towards yeah. an end where we're now talking about $50 billion? Is in a year's time, by the time you were president of the United States, should you win the election, it might be 100 or more, many hundreds of billions of dollars. It might even be boots on the ground of American soldiers no, in Ukraine. No, 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 no. Do you think no, that there, no, there is a point no. at which you have to stop? Of course there is, and there, and there should not be boots on the ground. And I think that there is a general consensus that the next six months of this war are going to be very determinative. Uh, every, every person of conscience wants a diplomatic solution to this situation. The issue is at what point, you know, people say we need diplomacy. Of course we need diplomacy. The point is, if you said to Vladimir Putin, at this point, let's have diplomacy, look at you like, what are you talking about? I'm winning this war. So if the United States just, uh, just withdraws our support at this time, that simply means the end of Ukraine. If we, if we withdraw our support at this point, there's no diplomacy to be had. There's just a nation to be crushed, and it would be crushed uh, by Vladimir Putin. I, 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 there should not be a blank check, but these next six months, I think all eyes are on what's going on there over the next six months, and then obviously a fundamental reappraisal at that time. I mean, just yesterday, Zelensky said that if the US did remove its its support from Ukraine, there would be a very good chance that Ukraine would either completely collapse or it would be a situation in which Americans would have to send their troops into Ukraine to, to defend their territories. Do you not think this kind of escalationist rhetoric on both sides is is a bit concerning for for US global relations? I mean, this is this is a big question if you're gonna become president. You have to know not just, okay, eventually it, too much is too much, but what actually is my red line? Do you have a red line? Is there something that you would say no to? The President of the United States should not make his or her policy decisions based on the rhetoric of the President of another nation. The, the United States has to make that, its that own. That feels like that has been the case yeah, for the absolutely. last year. So the fact, the, the, fact, the fact that the Zelensky said what Zelensky said, uh, certainly we listen to that. We, we pay attention to what all parties have to say. But we make our own appraisal. And I, I agree with uh, every European nation that I know of that uh, thinks that this is, this is an issue that affects more than just Ukraine. So uh, it's not that you, Zelensky says it, it's that our own appraisal, at least for many of us, is that he, on that one thing, he's correct. If uh, we withdraw support right now, Ukraine will simply uh, cease to exist. And I'm not ready to give in to that at this moment. This seems to also play into a narrative of dark versus light, good versus evil, that has been no, massively sold to the American no, public. No. Yeah, well, I don't see it that way. Uh, America, I mean, the United States is still selling arms uh, to Saudi Arabia. There is still a genocidal war in Yemen. So it's not like the United States has clean hands. The United States doesn't have a lot to be proud of here with our behavior in NATO. Uh, we have been reckless and we have been irresponsible. Once again, however, that does not mean that Vladimir Putin is a good guy. I mean, it's kind of like some bad behavior versus really, really bad behavior. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have to walk and chew gum at the same time. And the world is a complicated place and foreign policy is complicated. It's not black and white. So no, it's not freedom versus autocracy. It's not quite that simple. It's way more complicated than that. You can see that it's way more complicated than that. You can recognize, oh damn, this is gonna make money for the military industrial complex. That's the last thing I would wanna do. And still see certain behavior as simply what is necessary to serve larger interests of the world. To take the other side here, and forgive me for sounding like I'm a kind of sponsor of Raytheon or something, but there are many people who would say that any limitation on that blank check, as you call it, is actually just uh, a green card to Putin to say, well, look, in five years, 10 years, have another go and, and see how There's far reasons. you can get. There's a reason why presidents say what they say and don't say what they don't say. So uh, on that, I mean, uh, uh, no blank check is all that a president has to say. Uh, no blank check, but if, if, if Putin's not stupid, he's... Uh, He's a very, very dangerous character, but he's not stupid. And he knows that he would be unwise to underestimate the resolve of the United States if we really felt uh, the values uh, that we care about were at risk due to his behavior. Speaking of American values, you spoke a lot in 2020 about reparations, which is 
An another issue that's come up again this cycle and will continue to come up, I imagine, until some sort of agreement is found. Do you stand by your thoughts in the last four, four years about that? Because since then, we've had the whole Black Lives Matter fiasco when it comes to the informal raising of funds and then the total misuse, misappropriation of those funds. How do you react to that? Every people has a shadow side. Every situation has its people who do do things that they shouldn't have done. Those things happen. But I don't think that the misappropriation of funds by a few people um, nullifies the, the overarching good of the Black Lives Matter protests. We simply have not gone all the way. And I think that if Martin Luther King had lived, if either Johnson or even Humphrey had, had been president after uh, uh, Johnson's full term, I think this might have been different. To me, it is a debt that is owed. If you ask people about the past, which is, I suppose, the fundamental thing about reparations is you're dealing with something that's a long, long way in the past. If you ask an American about the past, the history of America, you find now that they fall into two very neat camps. There's either everything about the history was bad or everything about the history was great. Do you find yourself stuck in between these two kind of factions. It feels very tribal and split. I don't know where you find yourself. You mentioned something that's really significant. America does seem to be divided into two categories. Those who only want to look at what we've done right and are completely blind and have no listening for us looking at the things we've done wrong. But then there is another crowd, you're absolutely right, who only wants to look at what we've done wrong and won't give any credit to generations which have done things absolutely right. These tend, to, the tend matter, to fall on your side of the argument, don't they? The progressives, that they tend to be that camp. No, I, I very much celebrate what we've done right. I very much realize that we are both and. We are both and, you know, and that is the American story. You know, the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence established a, 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 a document and the founding of a nation based on the idea that all men are created equal. But 41 of those 56 signers were slave owners. So those that's the dichotomy. It's always been with us. And the glory and the, and the tragedy of our country is that generations, uh, every generation, including ours, reiterates that dynamic between those who are willing to go to whatever lengths necessary to expand the franchise and to actualize the principles on which we purport to stand versus forces who usually for their own economic purposes, usually very powerful, are willing to do whatever it takes to make sure we do not actualize those principles. But if you look at the history of our country over time, just as in your country, we have tended to self-correct. We answered uh, uh, slavery with abolition. We answered the institutionalized suppression of women with women's suffrage. Uh, we answered the Gilded Age with the New Deal. We answered uh, se um, segregation with civil rights. It's simply our turn. And it's time for our generation to realize that we have to repudiate uh, what Jefferson, uh, Thomas Jefferson called the general tendency of the rich to prey upon the poor, um, just as in other generations um, there have been forces preying upon the powerless and disadvantaged in their midst. One of the unique features of your campaign, both in 2020 and I assume again now, is that you are very open about your spirituality. And on the left, on the progressive side, that, that feels quite rare. In fact, increasingly extinct, an idea of someone who's willing to talk about religiosity and zeal in a landscape in which that is entirely associated with the right. Do you think that the left has a kind of godlessness problem? Well, I wouldn't call it godless. Uh, but when I was a, a child, there was a vital religious left in this country. Um, uh, William Sloan Coffin was a from, from Yale uh, uh, Theological Seminary was very active, uh, very important role in the um, anti-Vietnam War protests, as were the Catholic Berrigan brothers. Um, so this has been only in the last few decades. This is what I perceive to be over secularization of the American left. But that doesn't mean that the values are not um, spiritual because the values are so often the ones that are more humanitarian, that have to do with caring for people, caring for the planet, caring for animals. So they might not use the language, but I think many, in many cases the people who use the language are actually using the language as a cover 
for very inhumane policies. And then people who stand for the more humane policies just find some, you know, they're, they're maybe not as comfortable with some of the spiritual language. But I think all that's changing now. And it's particularly changing among Gen Z. These young ones find uh, I, that I meet, I find young people who are comfortable with both conversations and the integration of both conversations and don't understand why everything has to be kept in such distinct categories, because life is not that way. I'm very interested in this kind of question of religiosity and the right-left divide on religion and spirituality. One of the issues that seems to have kind of brought this bubbling up is Roe v. Wade and the question of abortion. I suppose the, the critique that many would make from, from the right perspective would be that the flippancy with which many on the left have spoken about the idea of carrying out an abortion does speak to a certain void when it comes to deep moral thought about questions like life before birth. That is something that I think could be laid out on the progressive side as, as a major hole in the talking points that candidates are, are going to be using in the next coming years. How, how do you feel about that? You are absolutely right. And I can tell you that when I've tried to speak of, of that issue in moral terms, I've been so poo-pooed, the, the, almost like the mean girl aspect of a certain group that have claimed the, the right to just dominate the languaging of that issue, uh, have seen it as a kind of slippery slope to even admit that there is a moral, uh, a moral dimension. And I think that this is part of what has lost us uh, so much support among the American population. This is how I see it. Abortion is a moral issue, but it is an issue of private morality, not public morality. And on, on the issue of what anyone does with their body, separate from sex with children, the government should have absolutely nothing to say about it. So. Uh, and, I, and I believe the, you know, and trust and have faith in the moral decision making of the American woman. It's her decision. And the, the government should have absolutely nothing to do with that. Now, I have known in my travels, I can tell you how many people I've known who are not pro-choice, but who have said to me, okay, but you, 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 you admit that it's a moral issue though, right? I say, yes, I admit that it's a moral issue, but it's a issue of personal morality. And some women feel that the moral decision is to not have the child because of their economic circumstances or whatever. And I have found a lot of agreement and alignment with people who themselves are anti-choice, but just wanted to hear that someone would at least recognize that it was a moral issue. So I think you make a very, very good point. This hostility that you're talking about, the inability to have those conversations, Absolutely. What, what, has, what has happened to us uh, as, I think, a whole Western culture that leads us to a position where we feel that we have to shut down, uh, belittle, finger wag at anyone who has even a kind of, as you say, not necessarily a policy disagreement, but just simply a kind of ethical disagreement with us on philosophical terms. What has happened to the culture where we have got to this point? We have lost the public square. We've lost the commons. We've lost the... Well, the commons the, are Twitter now, aren't they? They're run by Elon Musk rather than anyone in, well, a, in a cafe or a town square. Absolutely. If, if your only commons is on Twitter, where you have the permission, because nobody really knows who you are, to be the meanest person in the world, and you almost are going to get more hits and more clicks by being the meanest person in the world. You, you have not developed the habits of people who used to sit out on their front porches and talk to their neighbors after work. We've lost the what now seem like quaint uh, experiences, but the people are actually hungering for, like knowing who your neighbors are, and neighborhood parades, and being at the PTA meeting, and knowing the other parents of, the, of, the, of your kids' friends. That's like a bygone era, and people realize what's been sacrificed. But also, you can't blame people, given the economic factors that we were talking about earlier. When people are living in survival mode, they don't necessarily have the bandwidth or the energy to go to that parade or go to the PTA meeting. So that's why economics is so important. And I do think that the tech companies are wildly irresponsible. And um, particularly, I'm concerned about it in the lives of children. You know, the city of Seattle has brought lawsuits against the tech companies because it is now so, there's so much evidence for the damage that this, that this overuse of online uh, activity, you know, is doing to a child's brain. 
kids can't learn in school. They don't have enough sleep because of it. Their, their, their brains are, are rattled. Um, they're addicted. We're all addicted. We understand how that works. And now there are people who are trying to push back against it. And I think it's a good thing they're pushing back against it. You speak in a way, and correct me if you think I'm totally wrong, that I think is very overtly feminine. And what I mean by that is that you use intuitive language. You are not afraid to speak in the language of self-help, therapizing. You are also openly spiritual, vulnerable, and decidedly untechnocratic. And I just want to know if you think that if America has had this kind of paternalistic treatment for hundreds of years, is there room now for a feminine in politics? And what does that politics look like? Well, I think the politics looks like exactly what you just described. What's interesting to me is that, that this is how America speaks today. It's only in politics, like we act like it's fringe. A lot of the people, this is what's so interesting to me, a lot of the people who would be writing articles mocking me actually go to yoga class where they hear my name as the author of some affirmation that they are giving at the end of their yoga class. These are people who are in AA meetings. These are people who go to therapy. That's what is so outrageous, that they are selling their souls that way. They know, some of them know better. And those who don't know better are just trying to protect their perch. I think that um, I do believe that my, my country's changed a lot in the last few years. I think the world has changed, for better and for worse. And I think that a lot of people are willing to recognize what you just said, are willing to recognize the deep misogyny, are willing to recognize the peripheralization of whole aspects of our, of, of our humanity. And now, you know what it's going to come down to? whether or not people are willing to say so. I read an article by a man named Joe Balduck, I don't know how you pronounce it, B-O-L-D-U-C, the other day, just talking about my candidacy and the misogyny and, and how interesting it is that such conversations as mine should be deemed so absurd by the pseudo-sophisticates in our midst. The word they um, use is non-serious. They say you're a non-serious candidate, yeah. which feels fairly, fairly gendered. Yeah, so what I take seriously is the fact that the planet, the environment in which we live is about to implode if we do not more seriously mitigate climate change. I take seriously the 500,000 Americans go into medical debt every year. I take seriously that 18 million Americans cannot even fulfill their prescriptions that their doctors give them. I take seriously that 12 million children go to bed hungry at night in this country. I take seriously the fact that half our seniors live on less than $25,000 a year. That's what I take seriously, and they know that. And this, this, my country, in terms of its leadership establishment, is divided into two major categories, with some brave exceptions. Those who don't care to fix all that suffering, and those who don't have the spine, who don't have the moral courage to fix all that suffering. And the message of my campaign is let me in there and I will. One last thing. I spoke at the beginning about your prayer that you did on Oprah. I wonder now if you have a new prayer for America or whether it's still the same. It's a prayer that's etched in my heart. It's a prayer that's etched in the hearts of, I think, millions and millions of, not just people in my country, but around the world. The words don't matter. All of us pray in a different way. But yes, I will tell you this. If I'm ever president of the United States, Every time you hear the President of the United States speak, you've always heard him say to end his speeches with, God bless America. If they give me this job, I'm going to end my speeches with, God bless America and God bless the world. That's my prayer for America, that we remember we're part of a much bigger scene than just us. Marianne Williamson, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was Democratic primary candidate Marianne Williamson, a capitalist, spiritualist, and a progressive beloved perhaps as much in conservative circles as liberal ones, so certainly a rare bird. She spoke there about how psychic powers of light could overcome the evil she says has taken hold of America. She obviously has a flair for the dramatic. She was, it's no surprise to find out, a theater major. But beneath the quotes and self-help mantras is something I found quite compelling, a faith that a spiritual revival of some sort could reinvigorate American politics. 
I was pleasantly surprised by how defiantly anti-tribal she insisted on staying and how much of a critic she was of her own side as much as Trumpism. Uh, as the first to announce, she has at least made a bold start. So we'll see how it goes for her. Thanks, Marianne, for coming on. To you for watching. This was Unheard.